We'll come to order. This is uh, Education Innovation Policy. This is our last meeting to meet deadline. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the process, today we mark up the bill, which means we add amendments and then uh, send the bill to finance as it is rolled in with the uh, finance uh, bill here in the House. And uh, for members, if we need to continue this meeting, we will uh, resume after recess uh, in room 200 at five o'clock or the call of the chair. And to everyone, it's been a pleasure to have you uh, in the audience uh, visiting us, uh, uh, giving us insight into how we can make uh, education uh, in the public sector uh, better for our students, teachers, and hold our parents in high esteem at the same time. And to members, thank you for your hard work. Uh, I've been uh, very uh, pleased by uh, the input that you provide. Uh, you're very insightful members, and uh, uh, that means a lot. And I try to listen carefully to what you bring to us. And of course, to staff, especially to Ms. Para, who again has to work, uh, has had to work endless hours. Uh, to come up with our amendments and with our uh, delete alls, uh, and uh, of course at the beginning with the bill. So um, uh, we appreciate her uh, time that she has spent to make this uh, a very productive <coughs> session. With that, uh, Representative May Quaid, would you move the minutes, please, from March 20th? I move the minutes from the March 25th. Education meeting. Representative May Quaid moves the minutes of March 20, 2018. Are there any additions or corrections? Hearing or seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The motion prevails and the minutes from March 20 are uh, approved. So members uh, and audience uh, will begin with uh, my moving uh, house file uh, 3315 delete all amendment or the DE1 amendment, I guess I should say, uh, to be on uh, our uh, agenda today. And then with that, members, I will move the uh, H3315A40 amendment, which is the author's amendment. And let me just hit on the substantive changes that have occurred. The rest you will see are, many of them are technical, some of them come from the reviser, so that we follow the style of the statutes. But the first substantive change would be uh, beginning in the amendment line 1.6, where uh, to a college and career readiness, I have added the completion of rigorous coursework uh, that fits uh, a well-rounded education that would include advanced placement, international baccalaureate, concurrent enrollment, or, or the attainment of certificates or industry recognized credentials, so that we're covering both career and college. The next substantive change is on line 1.11, where uh, we have uh, tried to understand the, uh, the challenge that the commissioner faces uh, in reviewing those world best workforce plans that uh, may not be uh, meeting uh, uh, the achieved goal that's set down by reducing the number of curricula that have to be uh, examined to a sample of at least three and up to five, and then across a size and geographic distribution. Another substantive change is on page two of the amendment, line 2.11, uh, that we have added to explain the grounds for expelling the pupil instead of imposing non-exclusionary disciplinary policies and practices under section 121A.41 sub 12. Uh, we think that's important so that we are meeting the needs uh, of our districts in dealing with uh, different uh, occasions for expelling a, a, a student. Another is uh, 2.17, a pupil remains eligible for school-linked mental health services provided in the district until the pupil is enrolled in a new district. And members, I have trouble saying pupil because I always want to say student, but it is in statute that we use pupil. So. I apologize if I stumble there. Another is 2.19, the school district must provide to the pupil's parent or guardian a list of community mental health programs after expulsion. And you heard uh, Nami uh, refer to that uh, in testimony on Tuesday. 
uh, in, uh, on page three, 3.8, section 31, adding a parent notification, which we think is very important. Um, this is something that uh, we have lifted, I think, from uh, solutions, uh, not suspensions. A school administrator must make and document efforts to immediately contact the parent or guardian of a pupil removed from a school building or school grounds by a peace or school resource officer unless such notice is specifically prohibited by law. Those are the substantive changes. Is there any discussion? Representative Mariani. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was looking for the line items, but I've got the items and perhaps uh, staff can help me uh, in finding uh, where the question or, or, or um, where the page in line is. Um, I, I have three questions. So uh, the first has to do with the uh, modifying the measures of, of career and college readiness. And I, I like the direction in which the chair uh, is going uh, uh, with this. Um, is this the language uh, that um, originally had it, uh, a definition of career and college readiness that was solely tied to the MCA test results? Uh, Representative Mariani, yes, and Ms. Pira, would you clarify, please? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mariani, yeah, in the DE amendment, um, yes, the career and college readiness reversed the definition of career and college readiness that's in statute and, um, <coughs> and to the MCAs. <coughs> And, and Madam Representative Pera, what, Mariani. Madam Chair, Ms. Perra, what, what, what page do I find that on? Uh, this is on, uh, are you looking for the, mm -hmm. in the delete everything amendment? Thank you. And the A40, it's on page nine, line 12, after mathematics. I believe you're gonna delete that later in amendment, but. Well, uh, and, and, and Madam Chair, I, I, uh, I may not need to, and that's partly why I'm asking the question. <laughs> oh, that's um, pleasant to hear. So. Um, okay, I see it now. So it is. So, um, uh, uh, Madam Chair, and maybe Ms. Perra can help with this uh, as well. Is, is this uh, then a new language that you're adding in, in the, uh, the the amendment before us? Um, th does that language line up with the definitions of career and college readiness that we've uh, already established in state statute? Ms. Perra. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mariani, if you'll just give me one second, I can pull out the definition. The definition of college and career readiness um, does, does include some of those elements. Um, it says, has the knowledge, skills, and competencies to successfully pursue a career pathway, including post-secondary credit leading to a degree, diploma, certificate, or industry-recognized credential and employment, Students who are career and college ready are able to successfully complete credit-bearing coursework at a two, and four year, two or four-year college or university or other credit-bearing post-secondary program without need for remediation. So uh, Madam Chair and, uh, and Ms. Perra, then, then um, so the constructs are different here. Um, um, Slightly, yes. Uh, but, it, but it sure sounds like there's some overlap here. I'm, I, I've not had enough time to um, look at all the way through in terms of comparing apples to apples, but as I said, I do like the direction which the chair is going to make sure that we're including those multiple measures uh, for career and college readiness. We spent many years uh, wrestling with uh, how to do that um, um, uh, properly. And then, <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, the, the language that adds manufacturing to the fields of a school counselor, uh, where do I find that in the bill? Representative Mariani. Uh Representative Rarick, do you want to? Uh, uh, hey, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I, I'm first looking for the, I, but I do want to, I, I think I understand what's going on here, but uh, let me just get to my question. Um, in the original bill, uh, and this is uh, Representative Dep Depmer's language originally? That, that we're is correct, off? Representative yeah, Mariani, right. yes, to which Representative Rarick added trades. Got it. Uh, and then he felt there was an oversight and had left out manufacturing, so he added that in. Represent Mariani. Madam Chair, and I, I, I like the language in terms of the permissiveness of, uh, of demonstrating evidence of growth. Uh, I think uh, Eric, that's the right approach. Uh, have we changed the construct nonetheless of the Detmer language that uh, was, not, um, uh, was not a may in terms of demonstrating um, growth on the part of counselors um, and we had some discussion about this in committee. 
uh, but sure looked like uh, uh, when it came to uh, competencies with uh, military uh, access that those competencies were going to replace, potentially could replace the other elements that had already been in statute, cultural competency and a number of others. And, and is, does this language that you're amending um, uh, change that, that mer approach as well? Uh, Representative Breer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Mariani, um, that was a discussion that uh, Representative Detmer and I had. Um, when he was in veterans, it, it, that language probably would have. Um, but when we brought it in and I did the amendment to bring in skilled trades, we took it, brought it to the May so that it wouldn't replace any of any of that existing language. It would just be an option to be part of it. Representative Mariani. Representative Mariani, thank you. It's very helpful and I think it's also very wise. Um, so, uh, so then my question, Madam Chair, is are we using the same approach then? Is this approach of May just simply to the trades or does it include the other additional? Um, <laughs> Representative Mariani, I mean, Representative Rarick. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Mariani, it would apply the same to the, uh, the recruiters, the trades, and manufacturing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, one final, one final question. You have uh, eliminating the mandate for schools to use non exclusionary dis disciplinary policies and practices prior to dismissal. Um, this is maybe more complicated because there's a big construct that you're doing here. Um, and again, I, I applaud the, the, the chair's general direction in this in terms of incorporating some uh, thought and advice from the uh, coalition that you mentioned, the SNS coalition. Uh, we had a legislative task force on this uh, as well a year ago. Uh, so I, I'm really uh, pleased with the receptiveness, but I'm just wondering about the, does this language then uh, uh, no longer tie those kind of alternatives to the act of dismissal? Uh, Representative Mariani, we have uh, uh, allowed for this flexibility at the request of school districts. Uh, so no, I don't believe it does, but we have given them some latitude here Uh, uh, Madam Chair, members, I, and I appreciate the latitude. I'm also uh, mindful that as, uh, that as a legislature, as, as much as we re respect our school districts, we also understand that they may want to get out from under some important uh, uh, directives here. Um, so I, I, I want to look at this more carefully. Uh, obviously, we won't have time to do that uh, in depth uh, today, but I'm, I'm concerned that uh, school districts can now potentially dismiss uh, without, in fact, uh, offering those kind of alternatives. So the, it's, it's nuanceical, but the construct is really important. Current language in state statute is real clear to school districts that if there's going to be a dismissal, then there shall be an alternative uh, in some way offered. This still language appears to keep an alternative here, but yes. doesn't necessarily strong, strongly tie it to the act of a pupil dismissal. So I, I'll and I'll, I'll follow up with you, uh, Madam Chair, depending on what goes on here and uh, with school districts uh, in the coming days. And Representative Mariani and members, I do trust our school districts. They vary greatly across the state and they need to have flexibility in many situations and I think uh, in this one as well. Uh, and if we need to further amend this, we will do so in the future. But thank you, Representative Mariani, thank for you, that input. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, the chair renews her motion that uh, the uh, author's amendment, A40, uh, be uh, added to the delete all the DE1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The motion prevails and now the bill is in the order in which the uh, author uh, would like it and we'll proceed to other amendments. Uh, members, you have packets in your uh, green sleeve. And we will begin with the A31. Representative Pryor moves uh, the A31. So take some time, members, to find the A31. And once Representative Pryor has found it, yes, we have a multitude in front of us. 
you will explain. Representative Pryor. Thank you. I found it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so A31, when we're talking about um, um, what a parent needs to know uh, to choose a, a good school for their particular students, um, we've included the four-year graduation rate. But I've talked to my school district, and uh, one of my school districts particularly brought this up, that the four-year graduation rate um, it, it counts as people not graduating on time that were not intended to graduate in four years. And there's two, group of pe two groups of people that are in this category. And that's what this amendment is addressing. Um, so one group of people is the English language learners. Uh, so it's people that are moving into the district, um, young people that um, English is not their first language um, and that they're learning English. And in um, our high schools, the plan is that you get extra years to graduate so that you can have competency in English. Um, and that's basically planned for. So these students, if they graduate in five years or six years um, from the ninth grade, are, could still be on time. Um, and it's also, it's the interrupted formal education. Um, so if you're in a refugee camp, um, you, you've, you've, you've lost years of education, and so you can be 18 years old and not, and not have had your years of education. So that's, um, so that's what's being addressed, and that's one group of people. And then there's a second group of people, which is those with a disability and that are on a, um, an individual education program. Um, and so again, and I, one of, on, on the school board, uh, there's a parent with a child with, um, with a learning disability. And that child's plan is to have those extra years of high school before they have to enter the adult world. And that's the plan. So to say they didn't graduate on time um, when they are seniors is not really reflective of the quality of the high school. And um, this is actually probably an issue um, for Minnesota as a state. Um, in um, another committee, in the higher ed committee, we had testimony from, let's see, the group, uh, there's a, a group that compares um, higher education systems. Um, you might remember that. And we talked about Minnesota's high school graduation rate, saying that, you know, it's, it doesn't compare very well to other states. And I went back to them and said, you know, how does our, how we count graduation rates and how some children, um, some students stay on after those four years, you know, how would that affect our graduation rate? And um, I had an exchange of emails, and they said it would change up to 3%, that our graduation rate would be 3% higher. So we can see, you know, these two groups of students, um, English language learners with interrupted education, um, the students with, uh, you know, that are on the individual learning plan, um, they are affecting our graduation rates. So if you're a high school that has more of these students than another high school, comparatively, um, your graduation rate isn't as good. And that's to be, to be uh, not to have a parent be aware of that or that not to be reflected in the rating is not, is, you know, less, that information isn't as good for parents. So this is what the amendment is trying to address. I know that, um, you know, nationally, um, they just want one way of looking at a graduation rate. And that's, um, so I know from the department that was uh, what I found out, but, um, and not to have a different way of looking at it. But I think from a parent's perspective, this would be important information. Um, so that is my amendment, and I hope to have your support. Uh, thank you, Representative Pryor. Uh, what I would have to say today in regard to all of these amendments that deal with uh, Representative Ross Peterson's proposal is that you work with her. I'm going to be recommending no votes on all of these because it's very important that you work with the author and I think she would be uh, most open to many of the ideas that have been proposed here or at least some of them. Uh, so members, I'm recommending a no vote. Uh, is there any further discussion? Madam Chair. Representative Mariani. Madam Chair, I, I think that's uh, uh, unfortunate. Um, you know, the, the work of the committee is to shape bills. Uh, we can clearly shape bills uh, absolutely uh, as colleagues uh, when we're not in committee, but that's not happening in front of the public here. 
it's not happening in a public debate and having an open discussion here. And so I think it's good advice that you're offering, you know, to, uh, for all of us to work with any of our authors on bills, but this is the work of the committee here. And I'm really disappointed that we're just gonna carte blanche say no to a bunch of ideas here uh, without having a, a decent and open public debate on it. So I, I would oppose, uh, uh, I, I would uh, it, encourage support for this amendment if that's the only option before us since we're not gonna be able to have a, a debate apparently on it. Representative Mariani, we did hear this bill in this committee. It will be heard again in finance. And I think <coughs> Representative Peterson is very open to working. Uh, these ideas did not come forward earlier and so I would like to honor her, uh, her uh, authorship of the proposal and continue. So let's uh, vote. Uh, I renew uh, the motion by Representative Pryor uh, to add uh, A31, and I'm recommending a no vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no, no. Uh, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Mm. Representative kunish uh offers the A32 or moves the A32 amendment. Um, Please find your amendment and uh, speak to it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the A32 amendment um, would ask to insert that special education student progress means progress towards long-term goals for reading, math, academic uh, rates for students receiving special education service as prescribed by the commissioner under the approved for every student succeeds act. And um, this amendment, uh, let me find my notes here. <laughs> um, this would add that uh, special education student progress to the star rating system. I think it's really important that when our, our parents are looking for that perfect school to send their kids to, that they're looking for all the services that their students need, that um, special ed education pro progress is also listed in that uh, star rating program. And we look for um, the overall achievements and our ratios and that sort of thing. And when it comes to special education, I think it's just really vital that we are being very transparent and uh, forthwith with the information when it comes to special ed especially. So I would ask you to support this amendment. Thank you, Representative kunish Padin. You know, in S, the special education is not addressed and our goal is to come up with one uh, accountability system. So I'm gonna recommend a no. Uh, is there any further discussion? Representative Mayquaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members, I, you know, when we talked about this bill in committee, um, there were a number of things that were brought forward by both the parents uh, and the committee members, and the authors seemed open to adding those in. Special education was one of them. And one of the things I worry about the most are uh, parents and families who have kids with special needs. Uh, one of the things that they ask for often is help. They are often on their own, they are siloed, they are both the advocate, the parent, the caregiver for their children. Um, and so not including special education in this rating leaves out that entire group of parents from knowing what this school could possibly do for their kid. Uh, I think by leaving this out, we are both ignoring uh, the testimony that was given in this committee, suggestions that were given by this committee to the author, and an entire swath of uh, Minnesotans that need our support that we should be thinking about today. I think this is a good amendment brought by Representative Kunesh Padin, and without it, uh, we leave out all of special education as if knowing how special education does in a school is not important, and it is. So I, I urge your support for her amendment. Uh, and, uh Representative kunish Padin and Representative Mayquay. Again, I ask that you work with Representative Peterson. Representative kunish Padin. Madam uh, Chair, I would ask for a roll call on this, please. Roll call has been requested. Madam Chair. Representative Mariani. Madam, Madam Chair, um, the, uh, the importance of this kind of amendment, and there are others uh, like this, uh, quite frankly, um, are to ac accomplish a couple of things. One is to get some very important information. Uh, if we're gonna uh, barge ahead with a, a star rating system created by, I don't know who created it, quite frankly. I know it's a Representative Peterson's bill. Uh, we heard testimony the other day that, that parent groups uh, were not involved in the creation uh, of, of that rubric. Uh, but if we're gonna barge ahead with it, then I think it's really important that we take what we hear in testimony, uh, particularly from parents, 
uh, about th the kind of things they're looking for uh, to, to properly inform them about our schools. The other thing that this amendment does, and other amendments too, quite frankly, is it points out you know, what psychometricians, what uh, educators uh, in schools are cons have consistently told us, which is that a single data point is totally inadequate to tell a proper story uh, to anyone about the nature, the characteristics, important things, how a school functions uh, to the public. And that is what the public is asking for. I don't think anyone here is arguing that a summative rating uh, uh, itself um, is uh, totally ob objectionable. The issue is uh, what are the algorithms, what are the mechanics that construct uh, that, that rating? And what we have before us is frankly um, a summative rating system that's based uh, primarily on a single data point. Um, and so this amendment and others are adding other data points, more information <laughs> that the public actually cares about. So as we cast our vote members, I want you to think about that. That you know, you're gonna be saying yes to uh, information that the public wants, more than one data point, or you're voting to just simply provide a single data point on a rubric that was constructed by who knows who. Members, I also think this would be a, a good discussion in the working group for special education. Uh, so again, the, the chair recommends a no vote. All those in favor say, oh, excuse me, roll call requested. The clerk will call the roll. Representative Erickson? Uh, no. Daniel? No. Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Fly? Yes. Christensen? Russell? No. Haley? No. Jessup? Kunish Podine? Yes. Lee? Yes. May Quaid? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Barrett? <coughs> no. Erdahl? No. Ward? Yes. There being uh, seven ayes and nine nays, the motion does not prevail. It is not adopted. May Quaid, Representative May Quaid offers or moves the A13 amendment. Please explain your amendment once you've found it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, this uh, amendment adds the average class size for a school and or district, and it compares it to the average statewide class size by grades uh, to the components of the star rating. Uh, one of the things that we hear both from parents and teachers is the importance of um, individual time with a teacher and a student and how class size often affects uh, students' ability to learn in a classroom. I uh, can tell you I had teachers in my district who have class sizes that are so big that all of the students can't actually sit in the classroom and see the board all at the same time. So we know class size is important not only to uh, students and teachers, but it's also important to parents. So this amendment would add class size in as something, an important data point to know, and I would request a roll call vote on this as well. A roll call vote is requested. Further discussion? Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, Representative McQuaid, I, I wanna thank you for bringing up class size. I think it's very important. And there's some other amendments I know coming up here that are gonna discuss uh, school, or school counselor ratio, uh, number of ESL teachers and things. I think those are really important. However, um, I think we are, are confusing here the goal with the strategies uh, and then the strategies to reach that goal. And I know a number of us are teachers here, so we know we were taught to make sure we are measuring the, the outcome, the goal, and not measuring the strategy we choose to get to that goal. For example, when I was teaching reading, I know it's really important for my students to have access to lots of reading material. Um, a good library isn't really important, but I didn't base my students' grade on access to a good library. I based their grade on their achievement progress. And so this school report card is measuring achievement progress for students. And I think though all these things are really important, class size, those are strategies <coughs> schools choose to get to that goal of 
successful students and graduation and that kind of thing. So I think it's important to maybe have these things somewhere where parents can access them on a website. You know, how, what is the class size, uh, teacher student ratio? Make sure it's truly showing that teacher student ratio and not the entire school. And you know, sometimes they like to lump in all of the licensed instructors. But I don't believe it belongs in the school report card because we are measuring student achievement. We're not measuring the way schools are choosing to reach that achievement. Does that make sense? So I think these are important, but I don't believe it belongs in the report card. Representative Pryor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, if I may address um, that comment from Representative Bennett, which I appreciate, but um, I'm coming from the perspe perspective of what a parent would know. And I know that that would be something that I, um, as a parent, I would think is really important to understanding, um, you know, the report card on my on my child's school, um, what the class size is, and and I I guess I as a parent I might even assume that was part of the star, um, uh, and because we know that class light is so important, um, so I would I, I I am supportive of the amendment, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Maquade. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Representative Bennett, I, I understand what you're saying. I also think that um, this is actually getting to the heart of why this uh, summative rating was brought to the committee in the first place. We heard testimony from parents saying that they need information to make decisions for their, their kids about their schools. The information that's being included in the current summative rating in, as it's currently written is very easily findable. I found it for my entire district last night, school by school and for the district. So um, duplicating something that's already findable, not just through uh, whatever site digger or school digger, whatever it is, um, but actually just findable on both the district's website and through MDE, that doesn't do anything. This is the information they were asking for. Th these are the types of things that they came and testified in front of this committee that they wanted to know. We want more information that's findable so we can have information about the schools for our kids. How students do on a test is already findable and that doesn't tell them anything about their kid. Class size tells them stuff about the school. So that's why we're bringing a, a bunch of these amendments because it's actually adding in information about schools that parents do ask for, want, and need, um, and not just putting test scores into a, um, a formula and then giving them a star based on proficiency. Uh, thank you, members. This is not data that is uh, you know, found in the ESSA plan as we're trying to uh, create one accountability plan. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Erickson? No. Daniels? No. Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Fly? Yes. Christensen? Grossel? No. Haley? No. Jessup? No. Kunish Podine? Yes. Lee? Yes. May Quaid? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? No. Ward? Yes. There being seven ayes and nine nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Uh, May, Representative Mayquade offers the A22. Please explain your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, this uh, amendment would add in the ratio of teachers of color to the number of students of color to the star rating. Uh, one of the things we've talked about in this committee and continues to be talked about is how important it is that you have someone who looks like you uh, in positions of power in your classroom. You can't be what you can't see. Uh, we have very low percentages of teachers of color and as we seek to increase that, um, this is important information, particularly for parents of color uh, when they're looking at sending their kids to to school, so I would ask for your support and I would also ask for a roll call on roll this amendment. Roll call has been requested. And this information is found in the world's best workforce, just so you know. So the chair recommends a no vote. Uh, Representative Mariani. Madam Chair, I would encourage members to um, support this. Um, in the past uh, few years, this legislature has begun to open its eyes to the uh, almost total lack of, of diversity among our teaching corps. Uh, force across the state and uh, the chair herself has been supportive of many efforts to uh, 
uh, better resource our existing system to produce more teachers of color um, and American Indian teachers <coughs> in Minnesota. Uh, the sad truth is that that number hasn't moved in 30 years. That percentage uh, hasn't moved uh, in 30 years, even though our, our, um, our student population uh, in 30 years has gone, uh, students of color and American Indian students have gone from Less, less than 10% to uh, a third now of our publicly enrolled uh, students. Um, meanwhile, the diversity of, um, of teachers, teachers that come from their own, from those communities and reflect those students has stayed a static between three and 4% uh, for 30 years in a row. Um, and so finally, in the last couple of years, we uh, have uh, really uh, reopened their eyes and it's been a bipartisan effort uh, to the importance of this um, and the need to uh, do something you know, that can accelerate that. Uh, this amendment basically um, allows the, the, the public, particularly parents, to be part of our effort of holding the state of Minnesota accountable uh, based on information about their very specific school uh, in terms of how they're doing um, uh, uh, with that with that effort, uh, you know, members, um, uh, the two groups that came and, and testified on behalf of the uh, the star rating uh, system were the business partnership, and they repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly said that the purpose of um, you know why they're they're doing this is because they want parents to have information that parents uh, uh, most require. The parents that were brought uh, to testify said, we need information. Uh, they didn't say, we just want to know about uh, the MCA test scores. They said, we need a bunch of information. And so again, you know, uh, this amendment and others are about responding to the very arguments that the business partnership and the parents, uh, including parents of color, uh, gave in this uh, committee through uh, at least a couple of hearings. Um, and so I say that we should listen uh, to uh, the parents. I suppose we should listen to the business partnership when they say what the purpose is and this purpose matches up with it. So um, I don't see the issue here. I think we ought to support this amendment. Thank you, Representative Mariani. Again, uh, we're working toward one accountability system and this can be found in the world's best workforce. Representative Bly. Thank you. Madam Chair, um, I, um, I, I very much support this uh, amendment and um, I happened to be, as I was driving up yesterday from uh, Northfield, I listened to a uh, discussion on public radio about a recent study from the University of Virginia that uh, extensive research that showed that African American uh, young men uh, and boys uh, always fall behind. They don't have uh, the success rate that uh, other uh, groups do and um, attributed this to a systemic problem that we need to face. And I think this approach, this idea is um, a systemic answer or way of addressing this issue. And um, it, it concerns me that you know we continually kind of look at the school as the one answer to this problem when we need to be looking systemically at the problem. And school is one, one um, place in our society that we can address it. Uh, we heard from the business partnership about the opportunity gap or the gap that exists already and that the desire to address that. But you know, uh, my opinion has been and has always been that the single test or a test uh, um, result does not adequately measure the school's efforts to try to address the systemic problem. And um, so parents who look at just the test scores or just a single rating and say, I know that's the school for me, may discover that uh, that is not the case, uh, that the school may not be welcoming, that the school may not reach out to them and may not be willing to make this, the systemic changes that are important. I don't know, uh, that, that's just a guess. But I think it's important that we continue to communicate to parents in as many ways as we can that there is not a single measure, there's not a one way to look at a school. And uh, when I asked uh, uh, Mr. Bartholomew about 
um, this rating system, um, and he indicated that uh, you know we, they'd have to get more information. They'd have to go somewhere else. Well, I, I, what is the purpose of the single uh, you know star rating if uh, if it's a, the expectation is that parents will go further and understand the uh, complexity of the school and whether or not it's friendly and, and uh, it's, it's trying to do the systemic change. I, I, I don't understand, you know, I, I, there may be parents out there looking for that, that star rating that will tell them, but it's not gonna tell them what they need to know. And in, unless they go further uh, and are, are, that's communicated to them. It seems to me that the, what was described to us uh, uh, how the dashboard will will work it, it's all kind of in one place and you can look deeper very quickly and very easily into other things in addition to going to the school and looking at it so um, I think this is extremely important I think that uh, we need to be talking about uh, what systemic changes can we make to improve the situation that we see uh, if we look at the future of our state and the complexity that we are going to be uh, embracing as uh, the population changes. This is perhaps the most important issue we need to face, and I hope that we do so. Thank you. Representative Bly, uh, thank you for those insightful remarks. I hope you will talk to Representative Peterson, and please remember that this information can be found in the World's Best Workforce Plan. Uh, roll call has been requested. Please call the roll. Monica Erickson? No. Daniels? No. Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Fly? Yes. Christensen? Russell? No. Haley? No. Jessup? No. Kunish Podine? Yes. Lee? Yes. May Quaid? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? No. Ward? Yes. There being seven ayes and nine nays, the motion, uh, the, the amendment is, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Representative Bly moves uh, the A23 amendment. Please explain your amendment, Representative Bly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment would include um, the ratio of school counselors into the um, uh, that a school in, in a student's school to um, add to the, the rating system and um, again uh, you know I could, I could repeat what I already said that this is an issue of trying to make sure that the school is putting in place the kind of systemic changes that need to be there to improve uh, the opportunity gap that exists in our schools and in our society as well uh, I think uh, over the years we have seen a decline in this ratio of counselors to, to students. Uh, and um, I, I think as our society changes, the need and the use of stu school counselors is going to change, and uh, the need for them is gonna be even greater. And I think parents have a right to know what that ratio is. Uh, and I, so this is the purpose of my amendment. Thank you, Representative Bly, you make a good point. And I hope you will visit with Representative uh, Loon because she is working on uh, both counselors, nurses, social workers. She has proposals to come forward in that. And I know you're not on finance, but Representative Mariani is, and so please share that with him. Representative Bly. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Uh, Representative May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, it was counselor's day at the Capitol not too long ago and my counselor from my high school uh, was in my office because uh, she's my constituent now. And um, we were sitting there and we were talking and she said, you know, the thing that I did for you, what she did for me was I, I had all these aspirations. I was gonna go to NYU or Georgetown or, or Notre Dame. And then as it got closer and closer to making that decision, I got closer and closer to home until I was just 20 minutes away in St. Paul at St. Thomas. And um, it was because of Ms. Schoen that I, I chose to go to St. Thomas or at least apply. And she said, I don't get to do that for kids anymore. Just sit down and ask them, what are your plans? What are you gonna do? And make a suggestion like, maybe have a school that's close to home just in case. Because what she's dealing with now is a kid who's freaking out and crying and having to sit in like a fishbowl where everyone can see him because she has another student in her office that's also freaking out and crying because students are dealing with an insane amount of mental health issues. And we don't have enough counselors, we know that. 
but this is something that not only parents want to know, but students want to know too. Students ask me all the time why they don't have more counselors in schools, and this metric in particular can help parents understand, will this school have the type of support that my student needs? So uh, thank you, Representative Bly, for bringing this. Members, I really urge us to um, consider this. This is the work that the committee was sent here to do. Uh, you know, Cherix, and you keep mentioning that all this is, is found on world's best workforce, so is proficiency scores. If we're gonna measure schools, then we should measure, measure them by the things that are important to parents and students, as we have been told over and over again. Thank you, members, and please continue to uh, visit with Representative Loon as she's bringing forth some very good proposals. At least she's working very hard to accomplish this. I, too, visited with uh, interns and counselors this past week and uh, was delighted uh, to hear the good work they're doing and how our students who are in our college programs are coming forward. Uh, but the chair still recommends a no vote. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, no. Daniel? Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Lai? Yes. Christensen? Grossel? No. Haley? No. Jessup? Kunish Podine? Yes. Lee? Yes. Makeway? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdolph? No. Ward? Yes. There being seven ayes and nine nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <coughs> Representative Lee offers the A24 amendment. Please explain your amendment, Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. There's a similar to the uh, Representative Quaid amendment earlier. Uh, it adds to the primary school rating components, uh, the ratio of teachers licensed by Pillsbury or approved by their districts to teach English learner students to the number of English learner student, uh, to the number of English learner students. And I want to say thank you, Madam Chair. I'm glad to see that EL students' performance were included in the overall rating, but I think it may be more meaningful to our parents of EL students to know that there are enough staff in the building who are qualified to teach their children. Uh, the amendment will add this rating to the factor used to calculate the overall star rating, and it will not require this information to be re reported separately. And uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to request a roll call. Re roll call has been requested. Thank you, Representative Lee. Uh, remember, uh, and you did compliment uh, the fact that we have English learners, English language learners now in the uh, rating system, and that's very good. I'm not sure to what extent the ratio would make a difference. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Madam Chair Erickson? No. Daniel? No. Mariani? Si. Barr? No. <laughs> Bennett? No. Bly? Yes. Christensen? Grossel? No. Haley? No. Jessup? Kunish Bodine? Yes. Lee? Yes. Makeway? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? Nine. Ward? Yes. It's good to know we have three languages known here at the table. <laughs> there being seven uh, ayes and nine nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Uh, <laughs> Representative Mariani offers the A26 amendment. Please explain your amendment. Uh, Madam Chair, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask for a roll call on this amendment. Um, um, but I, I do want to use it uh, to offer the, the committee a, uh, quite frankly, what could be a bipartisan uh, and, and open way for us to do what pretty much everyone is telling us we ought to do except for one uh, special interest group that we heard from. Uh, this committee, uh, in the past few minutes, uh, just said no, you know, to adding to a single data point summative system additional uh, data points, some that uh, parents, uh, some who came in Spanish, uh, spoke in Spanish uh, to us, told us were important to them. Uh, we said no to including uh, teachers of color uh, measurements. We said no to including uh, counselor uh, ratios and. And, and measurements. We said no to special ed uh, dimensions to the summative rating. We said no to uh, understanding four-year graduation rates uh, to the summative rating. We said no to class size uh, to the summative rating. And we just said no to uh, the EL diversity uh, of the teaching co uh, force core uh, community in any given uh, school. 
Um, and so basically we've just been saying no to things that we spent a whole lot of time hearing from other folks and discussing among ourselves that are vitally important. Um, and instead we're continually opting for that one single data point um, uh, based on uh, summative uh, standardized uh, test scores, which quite frankly the public um, uh, accepts, but the public also has incredible uh, and rightfully so nervousness about using that single data point as such a huge determiner for what we ought to expect uh, our public education system to do uh, uh, effectively uh, with our students. So, uh, Madam Chair, we heard uh, from the uh, committee, or rather from the department, uh, that there is a stakeholder group um, that has been working uh, on providing um, a, a well-informed um, uh, tool uh, that could be easy to use. Uh, we heard uh, Dr. Nolan from MREA uh, step up and describe uh, very briefly what that thing is starting to look like, uh, which really is, you know, in one page, a, a simple, digestible, but powerful uh, series of information that includes some of the things uh, perhaps that I just uh, mentioned that we said no to, um, to powerfully inform uh, parents in the state of Minnesota about the nature of their, their schools. And um, that stakeholder group is working on that. Uh, my amendment would uh, stop, uh, would replace uh, uh, our, our proposal before us to use a single data point uh, summative uh, measurement that doesn't include any of the things that we just talked about. Um, and instead, uh, require the department to uh, get that dashboard done. And to get it done, um, uh, it's a very aggressive and assertive amendment. Uh, it's saying you need to get this done soon and you need to report back to us uh, what it is. Uh, the department is actually not totally comfortable with my aggressive uh, posture, but I think it is important that we push our uh, executive branch uh, to move uh, uh, forward in developing that well-rounded tool. Uh, so members, um, you know, we, you know, we can go down this path uh, of creating and empowering and putting into the state statute a flawed tool that pretty much everyone except one interest group, um, you know, came forward, um, not as a result of a stakeholder process, certainly not as a result of parents, uh, parent organizations asking for that. Uh, I suspect that, that our constituents, all of us, no matter where we live, what they want is something that's usable, something that's digestible, something that empowers them. The summative star rating system does, does not do that. Um, the dashboard uh, tool that the department is working on with the input of a diversity of, of stakeholders from across the state uh, has the potential to do that. And by the way, uh, that stakeholder group uh, may involve a summative tool of some type as, as a part of that. Uh, I suspect that if they do, they'll do a summative tool uh, based on the kind of amendments we had here before. In other words, based on the kind of information that Minnesotans want and expect uh, to be uh, transparently uh, put before them so that they can have a good, quick assessment uh, of how effective their schools are. So members, um, I'm not going to I'm not going to request a, a roll call vote. I I, I offer this as um, a really good inclusive uh, attempt for us to move forward sound public policy and not the flawed tool that we have before us. Thank you, Representative Mariani. I understand what you're saying. I would disagree that the proposal by Representative Peterson is a flawed system. I think it needs massaging and uh, input from all of you. Uh, the dashboard is stalled, and I read the latest report uh, from the stakeholders, and they're at odds on what should be in the dashboard and how it should progress. So, members, I'm recommending a no vote on this, uh, with due respect to Representative Mariani, uh, Representative May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, I, I think the way that we do education policy in Minnesota has been. Um, very much about local control. 
And the reason is, is because what works in Apple Valley isn't always what works in Zimbrota. And we leave our school districts to figure that out. Similarly, what works for my nieces who live up in Duluth is not what uh, my sister-in-law down in Jeffers, Minnesota needs to know about schools for my nieces and nephews there. A summative rating would assume that all parents only need to know the proficiency of math and reading for the school to make decisions. And that's not what parents need to know. We, we made an attempt with a lot of these things and, and Representative Mariani went over them. There were so many more we had ideas for. Uh, what would have been a good school for me might have been different. What would have been a good school for my brother? And we were born and raised by the same parents. So to assume that this summative rating is in any way helpful for the diverse and wonderful families and students of Minnesota is it, it goes against everything we have set up our education policy to do. It goes against everything we've ever heard a parent come and testify about what is helpful for them. It goes against everything that has been uh, said about from students, what is helpful for them in schools. And so this, again, like Representative Mariani said, with the exception of one special interest group, when the principals and the school board members and the rural school board members and the parents uh, and the teachers and the counselors, when they all get up and tell you that this is not good, we should listen. Uh, that is the work of this committee. Uh, I'm not sure why um, a business partnership with no partnership with parents um, or the department coming forward with this very flawed proposal that Chair Erickson, you've admitted, needs to be massaged, um, and you encourage us to give input to the author, this is our input. It needs to be different in order for it to even resemble something that's helpful for, for parents. And I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that we can get this dashboard up so that parents can find the information that they need to say if the school is good for their students. So I, I urge us to uh, adopt this amendment. Uh, members, I still recommend a no vote with all due respect to represent Mariani and keep in mind that you know You can look at the world's best workforce for each of your districts. That's very much local control and uh, As representative Mariani suggested there probably will be a summative uh, some kind of summative information uh, Included in the dashboard, uh, but let's proceed to our vote um, all those in favor of the A26 amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say no, no. The motion uh, does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Uh, Representative May Quaid offers the A39 amendment. Please explain your amendment, Representative May Quaid. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So members, um, you know, I talked about this a little bit in previous committees, but the way that the uh, current star rating calculates the gap between students of color is uh, it takes students of color in a school and then it compares their proficiency in reading and math to white students statewide. And uh, that does not show a gap. Um, it is, it, it's not indicative for parents or students to know what the gap is in that school. So I'll give you an example. In ISD 196, um, if you put all students of color together, which in and of itself is a problem, but if we did that, um, for our math proficiency, we are at about 58%. Statewide, uh, white students are at 68%. So using the current calculation we have in, in law, it would assume that there's a 10% gap uh, between students of color and white students in our district. But in our district, white students read at a much higher, or have a, a math proficiency that's much higher, and there is a gap of 18%. So the way that this current calculation works doesn't show the true gap in that school. So this amendment would modify the calculations to compare students in a school to students in a school to show the true gap. That is true for both low income and it's true for students of color. Um, if we're going to go forward with these very th small three data points that are already available and a summative rating, we should at least be comparing the students in a school to each other and students in the district to each other so that parents can at least get accurate information. Uh, thank you. And I would request a roll call on this uh, amendment. A roll call has been requested, and Representative Maquade, be sure you talk to Representative Peterson about this change, because I believe you'd be lowering expectations mm -hmm. if uh, you chose to delete statewide and go to A schools. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Madam Chair Erickson? No. Daniel? No. Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Fly? Yes. Christensen? Russell? No. Haley? No. Jessup? No. Kunish Bodine? Yes. Lee? Yes. 
Mayquay? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? No. Ward? Yes. There being seven ayes and nine nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Representative Lee offers the A27 amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. The A27 amendment adds the definition of students of color achievement gap score and requires uh, the student of color achievement gap score to be calculated individually for each racial category of students rather than as an aggregate score for all students of color. And I believe that um, Calculating of schools start rating based on students of color as a whole rather than based on individual racial categories may not be helpful to some parents of students of color. For example, a school may serve its Hispanic population well, but not for Asian American or African American students. And this should be taken into account in the star rating system. And uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. And Representative Lee, this is, you know, this is a pretty good idea that you should discuss with Representative Ross Peterson uh, because I think she would consider this, but this is not the place to make that change. Uh, the clerk will take oh, the roll. Madam Chair. Representative Mayquaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to speak to this amendment, members, I you know, mentioned just previously, uh, if we did all students of color in my district, we'd be about 58% proficient in math, but that is not information that's helpful for parents of color uh, so if they're Hispanic, it's at 39%. That's very different than 58%. If they're black, that's 42%. That's very different than 58%. If they're native, they're at 64%. Also very different than 58%. People of color are not a monolith, and to put them all in one group and pretend that they are is super offensive. So please adopt this amendment because this is not information that is helpful for parents of color or who, people who have uh, students of color because we're not all the same. And so comparing or lumping us all together and then averaging it out um, is, is really, really unhelpful. And uh, I, I urge us to at least, at least acknowledge that uh, racial groups are different and that if parents are looking for this information, it, it should be more specific than just students of color. And Representative Mayquay, that is something you need to talk to Representative Peterson about because I think she would be very interested in hearing your approach on this. Representative Bly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the things that concerns me about this is that, uh, and this doesn't necessarily uh, directly relate to what uh, Representative Lee is trying to accomplish, but this is another reason in my mind why the testing, the MCA testing, is not a good measure for what kind of school might be good for uh, a student of color because uh, there has been some uh, research done about this kind of testing that shows that it's not really culturally sensitive and that when we have students uh, with different cultural backgrounds, I think it's very difficult to say that this is the uh, uh, measure that we should use to determine whether or not this is the best school for a Hmong student or an African American student or a Hispanic student. I, I think we need to be more careful about how, what the kind of communication we're giving and, uh, and you know, I, I, I know I can anticipate you're wanting me to, call, to talk to Representative Peterson, but uh, I'm not sure, you know, when, when the, the impetus of this measure is that we use this, this kind of measurement to tell us what's, whether a good school is good or not, doesn't get at the hidden information, doesn't get at other things. So uh, I, I have a problem with uh, using that kind of test result that is, is, does not necessarily measure, uh, just as a, a little comment, uh, my wife recently uh, has, well, for some, a couple years now, she's worked in a uh, uh, remediation program that, that uh, helps immigrant students uh, learn better. And many of the things that are used to help them uh, learn about, uh, you know, learn the skills of reading and math uh, are not culturally sensitive. And they will uh, ask questions or mention things, and the students have no clue. They have no clue what's being asked or what's uh, being talked about. That's not a reflection on the test necessarily, but I think it just shows how sensitive we need to be to cultural differences. Thank you. Yes, and Representative Bly, you make a good statement, you know, and, and that's the burden we place on our teachers is to understand cultural competency is that ability for parents and, and uh, educators to work together to understand some of these nuances. And you know, that's, that's a, a responsibility we place now on our teachers. Uh, but I think if you would visit with Jennifer Dugan from our department who heads testing, 
uh, and all of her uh, work groups that she's had or uh, those of us who've come together uh, of, of all uh, ethnicities uh, to look at test questions that they're very sensitive at the department in the testing area to, to make sure that our, our uh, questions are uh, culturally sensitive. So I, I think, you know, I, I salute our, uh, our department uh, testing division. And um, as I said earlier, I, I think, um, yes, that you should talk to Representative Peterson. Representative Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like some clarification. Um, I, I think that our constituents expect us to have a robust conversation about the, what is before us. And my understanding is that this is the, the chairs and the committee's omnibus bill. And so I don't understand why we can't offer friendly amendments and have them um, address the issues of the bill or if it's going to be set up so that an, uh, the original author of the sections of this bill is particularly uh, Representative Peterson's name has come up multiple times because of the star rating issues, um, then perhaps she should have been invited to come to this hearing and, and let us have that conversation. You know, this time of, of session with deadlines, for all of us to go and track down a Representative Peterson or even try to have a meeting with her for all of us to be at the same place at the same time to have a conversation about these things would be very, very difficult. And I really thought that's why we were here today to address these things. So I, if you could help me understand that, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Well, Representative Ward and members, when we hear bills in here, as we did Representative Peterson's academic achievement rating system, that is the time when we purge, when we modify. Uh, these amendments should have come forth then, and uh, she would have taken away an understanding of some of your concerns. Uh, now it's going to have to be dealt with in the Finance Committee as it becomes part of a larger omnibus bill. And uh, in the meantime, we have time uh, to visit with her about any of our concerns. And so, uh, you know, this is just the way things are when it comes down to uh, uh, to hearing bills is that's the time when you really uh, dig in and that's when the author is here. We can't expect her to be here today because we don't take testimony. Uh, so, you know, I'm saying you need to visit with her. I think she's very open. I just visited with her yesterday. She wants to hear from you. How can, how can she make this idea, this concept better? And uh, if it goes forward, how will it be the best for um, our students? Madam, Representative Maykwade. Madam Chair. Representative Ward. Follow up, please. Yes. Um, many of these ideas, in fact, almost all of them did come up in our conversation. And some of them were a matter of discovery. Um, the agenda that I'm bringing forward was, was really um, a matter of wow, this is new information. So we would not have been in a position uh, to understand well enough some of these things. Sometimes we say, would you accept this as a friendly moment, amendment at the, at the moment? But um, I thought this was the time that we would be doing some of these things. So what you're saying is that we should um, make these conversations with the various authors. authors yes. um, and before the finance committee meeting so that how would representative peterson amend this i, I just how how does that work well i i can't speak for representative peterson but she has brought forth a proposal that is uh complex uh but refined and if we start amending that today without input then we are essentially gutting the proposal that she's brought forth. And I don't believe that we do that to any member's bill without the member having input. Okay. So, well, excuse me, Madam Chair. So we talk with her and then how my question is process. Then she comes to you or Representative Loon and makes the amendments or I mean, how, how is that going to be implemented. Representative Ward, she serves on the Finance Committee. Okay. So she will, uh, she'll hear your ideas, she'll figure out if they can be worked into this concept that she has. And, uh, you know, she's, she's a very uh, 
cordial, open yeah. uh, legislator, uh, and she's going to be uh, wanting to hear these concerns and uh, improve her bill if it goes forward. Thank you, yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Verdal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just a, a suggestion that might work. Uh, you know, yesterday I, I met with all the DFL members of my Capital Investment Committee and listened to, you know, their suggestions uh, about what we should be doing going forward. And perhaps you could try to line up a meeting with Representative Peterson with the DFL members and, you know, talk about your amendments with her and uh, uh, see where you go from there. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. Uh, very wise. Representative May Quaid. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, just to, to piggyback off of what Represent, Representative Ward said, I mean, the committee work is, is how we make bills better. That's why we do it in public. Um, and this is no longer Representative Peterson's bill. It's your bill now. It's, it's in an omnibus. The bill number is your bill. It's You're the author of this bill, and that's why we're doing this here in committee. Um, and, and when we had the committee meeting about Representative Peterson's uh, bill, at the very end, I still had many questions for her, and you looked down at it, and you shook your head, and then you moved on. And so the, the opportunity to do that work came and went, and so we are now, this is part of your omnibus bill, trying to do the work that was brought up in two committee sessions about Representative Peterson's bill. Um, having a meeting with eight different members, nine different members of a committee, um, doesn't mean that it gets included and how do we then have the accountability to know that it moves forward because once it's gone from this committee, it's gone from our ability to impact this legislation. And so, you know, bills don't exist only in the existence of the author. They are, get shaped by the legislators of this body um, as more perspectives are brought in. That's why we represent a specific area of the state. We bring that knowledge and it shapes policy. It doesn't only go through the author. And so I, I'm disappointed that we can't um, use the committee time for the purpose of committee time, which is to shape bills to more fully reflect the needs and values of the state. Thank you, and those amendments could have been offered when the bill was heard. Thank you. Uh, the roll call will be taken. Madam Chair Erickson? No. Daniels? No. Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Fly? Yes. Christensen? Russell? No. Haley? No. Jessup? Kunish Podine? Yes. Lee? Yes. Makeway? Yes. Fryer? <clears throat> yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? No. Ward? Yes. There being seven nays and nine uh, noes, the uh, amendment, uh, the, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is uh, not adopted. Uh, Representative Pryor offers the A17. Please explain your amendment, Representative Pryor. This is the one that deals with lead and water. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, this, uh, well, what we heard in testimony and had um, a very long and insightful discussion on um, was whether or not, um, well, we know that there is lead in the water and the drinking water in our schools. And what this amendment would do is one that um, when it's tested and discovered that there is lead, that parents should still be notified of that. Um, so, and this is, this is a perspective of a parent. Um, if the test is being done, and if that's the discovery, parents should be able to know that. Now, it doesn't um, say that it can't be put into a context of, of other situations of lead in the water, um, but at least a parent should know, uh, because we know that um, from the testimony from the health department, there isn't a standard that says this much lead is safe and this much lead is not safe. And given that there is no standard, um, we parents need to be fully informed about um, the water in, in their children's schools. And um, I think that's something that we, that we should be requiring. Um, it's something that should probably be worked with so that parents can understand the implication of it, but um, at least this idea of notification, I think, should still be, should still be in our bill. So I, I urge support for this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pryor. This is not a very well written amendment, uh, I must say. If you read the first sentence, uh, there's something missing. Uh, but members, if you recall, when we heard this testimony from the health department, from uh, Minneapolis Public Schools and others interested, uh, my charge to them was to work this out. And so I'm expecting that they'll work this out. Uh, it is not ready for today. That's okay. 
What we want is things worked out so that they are the best possible policies that we can enact. And so members, I'm recommending and, and, a no vote. Madam Chair, I do request a roll call. Thank you. A roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Madam Chair Erickson? No. Daniel? No. Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Fly? Yes. Christensen? Russell? No. Haley? No. Jessup? Kunish Bodine? Yes. Lee? Yes. Makeway? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? No. Ward? Yes. Uh, there being seven uh, ayes and nine nays, uh, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Uh, Kunish Padin, Representative Kunish Padin, uh, uh, moves the A20 amendment. Please explain your amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment removes the pathway to a tier three license that would allow a teacher to qualify with only three years of teaching experience under tier two licensure and evidence that their summative teaching uh, evaluations did not result in placing them on an improvement plan. So what this bill would do would allow an unlicensed teacher to continue teaching, well, <clears throat> I would say an instructor because they are not a licensed teacher yet, um, to continue teaching our students without that licensure. And I think um, what we do here in our committee is try to ensure that we are putting in place guidelines and expectations for the best teachers that we have that we can have and we've had many discussions about how great our teachers are how wonderful minnesota teachers are how hardworking teachers are um, what this bill would do or what this would um would allow the teachers or people to come into the schools without all of the necessary training and experience that a licensed teacher has. Um, I don't know how many of you know what it takes to get a teaching license. If you were to go to St. Cloud State University, you would need to complete 89 credits for your teaching license. With the way that things, uh, this um, bill would allow those uh, teachers at that tier two to move into a tier three position without ta taking all the necessary uh, classes and experiences that a licensed teacher has. So for example, um, a simple introductory education class, introduction to education, introduces the students to a broad field of education, including a focus on children and families, the role of the teacher, the role of schools and educational programs in communities and the broader society, history, philosophy of education, education futures, teaching education knowledge base and contemporary issues. And this also includes a field experience in different area schools. That's just one of the expectations of a licensed teacher. <clears throat> With this bill, um, person could come into a school and never have had that really important basic experience um, at the university level. And so at a time when we have um, high expectations for our students, we expect them to be career ready, um, shouldn't we also insist that the, the professionals, the people that we are putting into, in front of our students in our schools, um, have proof that they have that necessary experience and expertise and um, the credits that our, we expect all of our students to show proficiency in. Shouldn't we also have our educators that we are so proud of also have to um, experience? And so I uh, take great um, almost offense to this bill I think of all of the work that I personally have done to become um, the best teacher that I can become. I think of all the debt that I racked up as a, a single parent, um, making sure that I had all the licensure experience and expectations, passing the test to prove that I, yes, I had um, 
um, experienced all the education that I need, that I went in and did my student teaching and learned hands-on really what it takes. And what this bill would allow would, would be an expert in some area to um, come into our schools and eventually um, stay there indefinitely. And maybe all they would have to do is take a class to show, you know, a class every now and then to show that, yeah, they're working towards that proficiency, but maybe their, their um, goal really is not to ever get a teaching license. They could do this forever and ever and ever. Take one class a year, show that they're working towards their um, proficiency, and never even actually get that teaching licensure. So I would uh, very strongly uh, ask you all to um, vote no on this, or um, vote um, to support, <laughs> I'm not getting, my, my brain is so racing right now, um, <clears throat> to support this amendment and remove that pathway to tier three because um, the solution is not to make it easier to be a teacher the solution is to make sure that we have those high standards with real applicable experience uh, behind um, all of our pedagogy and the way that we are building strong schools for a strong future in Minnesota. Thank you, Representative. And I um, ask for a roll, roll call. call is requested, yes. Well, members remember that this was in the Senate omnibus bill last year, and we had a lot of debate and discussion about it in open to the public, many of you attended, uh, who are in the audience I know. This was signed by the governor. And you know, I really think experience counts. Uh, when I went to, to teacher prep, uh, there was nothing to it because I majored in my major. Uh, so uh, I, I had to count on a lot of experience. And I think three years of experience with a summative evaluation, which I know Education Minnesota honors because they argued against our repeal of the default for teacher layoffs last year based on teacher evaluation, that that's very important. So members, I'm recommending a no vote since this has gone through the process. Experience counts and so does the teacher evaluation and I'm quoting Education Minnesota on that. That's very important. So if we've accomplished that, Representative Mariani. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I, I, I do respect your, your perspectives on this. I, I was part of that debate uh, during our conference committee. Um, I'm struck by the fact that uh, the, um, the uh, amendment before us um, um, is uh, actually uh, holding the House's position uh, uh, from last year. And, um, you know, as someone who voted for your bill uh, and supported the final passage, there weren't very many of us, quite frankly, on my side of the aisle uh, that did that. Um, uh, there were elements uh, of this structure that uh, made me uncomfortable. I, I totally buy and accept the idea that uh, what we should be doing in our state uh, is really opening that gate uh, as people are coming in wider. Um, I, I think uh, that's going to be a, a wise move uh, for us over time. But the whole architecture, particularly from the House's perspective, uh, your bill, uh, Madam Chair, was to uh, consistently ratchet up the level of expectation and quality and standardizations of quality uh, as we move from uh, tier to tier. Um, and unfortunately, what the Senate uh, leveraged us into was extending out uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the more open uh, part of that architecture into the latter part the tier three and four, or tier three in particular, um, that our wisdom was we should be setting uh, higher uh, standardized quality standards uh, once we get to that. You know, the whole purpose of tier two um, was to allow teaching uh, uh, competent good folks to teach while they're preparing for tier three uh, through those standardized, uh, uniform, high-quality standards. And, uh, you know, I know the nuance, you know, may go over the head of most folks uh, in the public, but um, 
a summative evaluation on the part of one principal is going to be different than the evaluation that's handed out by another principal in another part of the state. And so it really does violate this notion of us holding toward the latter end uh, a consistent uh, standardization of high quality uh, expectations. Um, and so uh, I, I think, you know, I, I love our architecture. I love that it's opening up uh, the front end. I've gotten a ton of grief uh, from important stakeholders in my own political community over that. that. Uh, but I still think it's a wise thing for us to do. I don't think it's wise to continue to perpetuate that, um, that non-standardized uh, openness as we move up into tier three and tier four. Madam Chair, as you move through the system, uh, you met those standards. Um, and uh, you were, no doubt were a good instructor. Um, unfortunately, you know, we didn't, we didn't require evaluations uh, in this state. Some oh, my superintendent did. evaluated me. Some, some districts did and some didn't. Um, and I suspect you had a lot of peers that uh, were moving through the system without ever having an evaluation. I'm glad that we're, we've dispensed with that. Um, but similarly, you know, I think we should apply that high standardized expectation. Uh, of our tier three, uh, certainly we do it with, with, with tier four. This is a really good amendment that's only gonna strengthen the teaching profession uh, in our state and provide our students with what we need. I really encourage us to uh, go back to where the house and you were at uh, as we came out of here last year heading into conference committee and force the Senate uh, to argue once again why would, we would not have those high sets, uh, those high expectations for tier three. Thank you, Representative Mariani, but you know how negotiations work. We both give a little bit, and uh, I, I, I uh, acceded to this, and uh, it's in the law, and the governor signed the bill, and uh, the, my position would be that uh, there be a no vote on this amendment. And a, uh, a roll call has been requested. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Madam Chair Erickson? No. Daniels? No. Mariani? Yes. Farr? No. Bennett? No. Fly? Yes. Christensen? Russell? No. Haley? No. Jessup? No. Kunish Podine? Yes. Lee? Yes. May Quaid? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? Yes. Ford? Yes. There being eight ayes and eight nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Members on a tie vote, a, uh, an amendment does not prevail. Uh, I want to take a second to recognize some visitors from Princeton. Uh, as you all know, I live near Princeton in Princeton Township, and I'm a member of the Princeton Chamber of Commerce. And we have leadership uh, today visiting our committee, touring the Capitol, observing a Senate gallery session. Uh, so I'd like those visiting from Princeton, Minnesota's Chamber of Commerce to please stand. Thank you very much, Princeton Chamber, for coming in. I will join you later. Uh, what we're doing is walking, or we're not, we're walking, we're amending uh, the omnibus policy bill, which is under my authorship. It's a combination of many members' uh, bills. And the one we were just debating was based on a provision that was enacted last year uh, to change the way teachers are licensed. Uh, and not necessarily the way they're licensed, but the uh, system. Uh, we moved to a tier system instead of continuing to layer uh, state law with many different variations for how our teacher, uh, a teacher could be li uh, licensed in Minnesota. But welcome, and we'll continue this debate. Uh, we are, we're did, still in the amendments. Did, Representative uh, Erdahl. Did you teach any of them? <laughs> uh, yes, Florence, I taught you. <laughs> and remind me? Tracy. Tracy, yes, yeah. thank you. And Tammy. Well, of course, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't see you. Do you remember and their grades? You could maybe. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Florence earned an A. I think <laughs> Tracy probably earned an A. Tammy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I think I think they were all uh, these ladies were really good. Yes. And they're still very good in our community today. They work so hard. 
Florence has numerous uh, obligations, uh, Mille Lacs County Fair, the uh, American Dairy Association from the Mille Lacs perspective. She's in every parade I'm in because she brings the ambassadors for the Dairy Association. Uh, and uh, I could go down the line. We have the business manager from Princeton School District. Very good to see you here. And Nancy, from uh, she manages the municipal. and. Uh, and we have industry uh, represented here, so thank you very much. Uh, members, uh, Representative Mariani moves the 835 amendment. Please explain your amendment. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Chair the 835 amendment um, goes to the, uh, the PALSB, the uh, Professional uh, Educator Licensing uh, Board, which uh, we created um, in statute last year to replace the Board of Teaching and uh, to help modernize the process by which uh, um, teachers get licensed uh, in our state. Um, and Madam Chair, I, I, uh, I have a, um, a couple questions. I, I thought we, I had sent a letter uh, to the committee for distribution uh, on this. Do we have that? I don't have it in my packet. Either. Oh, we uh, we just received it from Mars. Okay. So right. I think it might have to come later. Okay, uh, ma Madam Chair, that letter is a letter from the from Pelsby itself, um, uh, and it's uh, signed by uh, a number of statewide. Uh, we'll see that in a second. The statewide um, education associations, uh, school principals. Uh, um, Oh uh, gosh, I better not name names because it's, I, I'm, I'm, you know, you know how that goes when you try to name someone, you know, like at a wedding or something and then you forget, you know, Uncle Tom and you hear about it for the next five years. Uh, but, um, but the letter's coming around. But, Madam Chair, the, the issue is this, and we do have uh, someone from the Pelsby uh, from the board here, uh, the interim director, uh, Alex is here. Um, we've not had a discussion in committee about this, and yet this is vitally, vitally important. So when we structured the, the board and the new uh, tier system, one of the things that we did is we set a very aggressive timetable uh, by which uh, the board would then implement the new uh, tier licensing uh, system for the sake of making decisions about candidates' uh, requests uh, to be licensed uh, at whatever level uh, they, they would be licensed uh, at. And uh, Madam Chair, you'll remember, you'll recall no doubt that in the conference committee there was uh, quite a bit of debate about whether or not <clears throat> that timetable, which is set for July of this year, was a realistic timetable, given the fact that uh, we were moving this board, we're creating a brand new board, including brand new members, uh, we were moving it out of uh, from underneath the Department of Education's, uh, you know, uh, physical space, as well as clearing up some of the divided uh, uh, functions in regards to teacher licensing, which uh, we agree was creating a heck of a lot of confusion um, and lack of accountability uh, in our state. All of that meant that creating something new like this is a really big endeavor. And it was my position and, and position of a number of us that we really needed to give this board more time than the uh, July 2018 um, uh, uh, you know, uh, deadline. Uh, nonetheless, the, the board, uh, um, the prior board went ahead uh, and moved uh, to engage the public and broad stakeholders uh, in helping it to set up its rules uh, for um, administering uh, the, the uh, new system um, and um, had public meetings, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, an administrative law judge, um, and I'm simplifying a little bit, basically said, you know, uh, you're going to have to start all over again uh, because, um, you know, come January, you're a brand new board. So you have to start from scratch. Uh, even though a ton of stakeholders had already been, had already been involved. Um, that has really complicated the ability of this board to be able to fulfill its statutorily mandated uh, uh, directive uh, to implement this new system in, in, in July. 
And we can agree to disagree about um, whether you know it should have moved even faster, differently, or whatever. The bottom line, members, is that uh, if this board doesn't have its ducks in order uh, come July, uh, it has no choice but to implement the system, whether it's you know it's crossed all its T's and dotted its I's. And here's the issue: uh, it opens the state of Minnesota up to some potentially serious liability issues as folks who may disagree uh, or have questions about decisions relative to their own um, um, candidacy for uh, licensure, um, they may come forward and sue the state. And um, it, we don't want to invite that. We want the system to work. Um, we have a good tier system uh, yeah, I had an issue with the tier two, tier three. We'll continue that. But I think basically we have a good approach here. We really need to make sure that it works. Um, and so basically what my amendment does is it gives that board um, the time to be able to competently, professionally, responsibly uh, structure its rules uh, to make sure that every person is coming forward um, you know, for, for their licensing. Uh, will have a fair, objective, and powerful uh, way to, um, to have that decision made and not have to resort to suing the state of Minnesota uh, in court um, because the rules were incomplete. Um, and if you don't think that won't happen, members, it's happened before, you know, I mean, we had litigation even under the, the prior board. Um, and so, and it makes sense, you know, stakes are high for folks, it's their livelihood, it's their profession. Uh, we owe it to them to make sure that our Pelsby uh, board uh, has solid uh, rules uh, to make uh, decisions about their profession and their uh, desire and willingness to teach our students. So, Madam Chair, uh, that's all really my amendment does. It, it, uh, it, it gives the time for the, the board to carry out its responsibilities uh, responsibly. Um, and Madam Chair, we do have the interim director uh, from the Pelsby board here. We've not had this discussion at all, uh, this legislative session, even though it's a huge and looming issue um, that should have been, quite frankly, at center stage of all our discussions uh, throughout this year. Um, uh, it would be good, Madam Chair, I think, to hear from um, the interim director about why this is important and, um, and perhaps even grill him on why you know, uh, he, he feels and the board feels that at this point um, they're really at risk of not fulfilling the mandate, not because they don't want to, but because time has worked against them. Thank you, Representative Mariani. We're not taking testimony today and, and the interim director has been present at many meetings and could have come forth and offered uh, any advice that he wanted to bring on behalf of the board. Yeah, sure. uh, and Represent Mariani, I am disappointed in the letter of the signers because not a one of these has come to me to express their concern that the July 1, 2018 date will not be a, a, a good time to implement this. Represent Mariani, I started last fall working with the, the Board of Teaching, of which you know I'm a former member, on the rules. They had rules ready. We discussed them uh, at two specific meetings. Uh, uh, Senator Pratt and I gave input, as did uh, Minnesota School Boards Association, uh, Ed Allies, uh, other groups that I see in the audience were present and gave input. Our expectation was that when January 1 rolled around and the new board took over, that they would uh, reconstitute the rules on which they had worked, to which we had given input, uh, sub made suggestions. I even met in my office with the interim director and one of the board members to propose that they go forward with the uh, rules uh, without uh, violating state statute, which they were doing on about three of them. And that seemed very promising. But the, uh, the administrative law judge has laid out for us, or for the board, I should say, a roadmap so that these uh, rules can be in place July 1 of this year so that we have the tiered system in place. And to that extent, uh, I think we need to move forward. 
Uh, maybe something will change in the future, but I don't think so because the board is negating the responsibility that they have, and that's to take those rules they have in, in front of them and move forward. And it is possible, based on the ALJ's recommendation, it is possible to accomplish this. So uh, with that said, Representative Mariani, I'm recommending a no vote on your amendment. Madam, Representative Mariani. Madam Chair, it's unfortunate that, that the chair uh, will not take testimony because uh, there, there is a lot of information that's missing for the members here. Um, you know, quite frankly, Madam Chair, the ALJ's decision sets up a totally unrealistic uh, timeline. Um, you know as well as many of us here that part of the rulemaking process involves providing uh, prescribed time uh, of notice for the public <coughs> to be able to weigh in. That's how we invite uh, as legislators and the executive branch the public to be part of the process of making vitally important decisions, which is what rules are. Uh, it's how we breathe life into laws. It's how we implement the laws. It's vitally important that we get that right. And so uh, our rulemaking process <coughs> has both a long and an expedited uh, timetable in which we can do that. Uh, what the ALJ has laid out for the Pelsby Board is totally unrealistic. And probably not surprisingly, because quite frankly, in my opinion, not in my opinion, my experience, uh, as, as, as great as ALJs are, uh, Ministry of Law judges are, they're not always uh, experts uh, in the given field that's in front of them. And so, uh, Madam Chair, there's more to say about that, but I'm, the, the bottom line here is that we can put our, our head in the sand on this issue and quite frankly, what we're doing is rolling the dice with whether or not our entire tier system could collapse in and on itself uh, through uh, litigation that can come forward. I don't know why any member, I don't care what party you're, you're, you're at, you know, would not take the steps necessary to avoid litigation on something so vitally important. And um, so, uh, Madam Chair, um, I don't think the Pelsby Board is attempting to negate its duties whatsoever. Um, uh, they, they moved uh, expeditiously. Um, uh, you were involved, as you shared uh, with us, as were others, uh, in helping them move and weighing in. Um, and unfortunately, and I don't know the details of that, but we should hear from uh, the, the interim director, um, we had an action come forward to challenge the very process by which they were engaging the public um, and then having an adverse decision saying, you know what, you can't use most of that, you're gonna have to go over that ground all over again. Oh, and by the way, here's a timetable that's totally unrealistic for you to follow in order to meet that July deadline. It seems to me the only logical thing we should do and the only responsible thing we should do is to extend the time out so we get this right. We're not changing anything um, um, in, in the tier system. Uh, we just simply want to get this right. And I, I Madam Chair, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that you would not entertain this. Uh, I don't know when during the, the last few weeks uh, we would have had an opportunity <coughs> uh, for the Pelsby Board to come forward because there, there wasn't a bill you know, on the Pelsby Board uh, on this issue. Uh, at, uh, at this time. I introduced a bill, we didn't get a hearing on the bill. You know, and so this is our only recourse is to offer an amendment uh, as we're constructing uh, this omnibus bill. So Madam Chair, I, I'm gonna ask for a roll call uh, for this bill. I think uh, this amendment, I think it's really that critically important. And I think it's important that the public knows um, who's taking a responsible posture relative to making sure that the law that we're implementing, uh, that we created, uh, in a bipartisan manner will actually work and whether or not we uh, are going to invite litigation or avoid litiga litigation this year on, on this. Line. So I ask for a roll call. A roll call has been requested and keep in mind the governor did sign this bill. The governor did sign it and even in his uh, first letter uh, he did not cite that this was an, uh, an unworkable timeline. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Madam Chair Erickson? No. Daniel? Mariani? Yes. Barr? No. Bennett? No. Why? Yes. 
Christensen? Russell? No. Haley? No. Jessup? No. Kunish Bodin? Yes. Lee? Yes. Makeway? Yes. Fryer? Yes. Rarick? No. Erdahl? No. Ward? Yes. There being seven ayes and no, uh, nine no's, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Members, we will stand in recess until the call of the chair or 5 p.m. in room 200. And there is a press conference going on outside this building, uh, this room, so you may want to take a different exit. Uh, the meeting stands in recess.